If you came across a piece of ancient technology, how confident are you that you'd be able to explain how it was made and how it worked? Do you have the specialist knowledge required for such a task? Very few people do, so it's a task that sometimes even stumps the brightest of scientific minds, as you're about to see. A fascinating discovery in Indonesia is rewriting the history of ancient cave art. Archaeologists have found a hand painted in an Indonesian cave that dates back at least 39,900 years, making it among the oldest such images in the world. This discovery, reported in the journal Nature, includes stencils of hands and a painting of a babarusa or pig deer, which may be the world's oldest figurative art. Previously, it was thought that the first cave artists appeared in prehistoric Europe around the same time. But this find in Sulawesi vastly expands the geography of these early artists. The cave art in Europe and Sulawesi predominantly features large, often dangerous, mammal species, suggesting these animals played major roles in the belief systems of these ancient people. The findings from the Maros cave sites on Sulawesi raise the possibility that cave art predates the exodus of modern humans from Africa over 60,000 years ago. Experts predict that even older examples of cave art will be discovered on Sulawesi, in mainland Asia, and ultimately in Africa. The oldest art, a red disc painted in Spain's El Castillo cave, is at least 40,800 years old, while a hand stencil there is 37,300 years old. The Steshak necropolis in Radim Laja, located near Stolak in Bosnia and Herzegovina, is a remarkable medieval site established between the 15th and 16th centuries. This necropolis is part of the natural and architectural ensemble of Stolak and is recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's situated in Vidovo Polja, two miles west of Stolak on the Kaplžna Stolak Road. The Radimloja necropolis is one of the most valuable monuments from the medieval period in Bosnia and Herzegovina showcasing the rich history and cultural significance of the region. The majority of its Steshok tombstones date from the 1480s through the 16th century, marking it as a period of prominence for the Miloradovich Stepanovich family from the genus Hrabren, who lived in the settlement located on the nearby hill Osanichi. The necropolis includes 133 stechi, a type of medieval tombstone with various forms, such as slabs, chests, sarcophagi, and cruciforms. The site was partially damaged during the construction of the Kapljina Stolak Road in the Austro-Hungarian period in 1882, which destroyed at least 15 to 20 tombstones. The core of the necropolis dates back to the end of the 14th century, featuring three big chests, two of which are richly decorated with motifs in bas-relief. The site also includes several Illyrian burial mounds, indicating its use as a resting place for the dead since ancient times. This next ancient wonder is known as the Hand of Hercules, but to call it a hand is being kind. Considering how little of the hand remains at the site in Amman, Jordan, it might be fairer to call it the Fingers of Hercules. There are just three fingers here and archaeologists aren't sure whether they were ever attached to a full-sized hand in the first place. The fingers can be found, appropriately enough, in the ruins of the former Temple of Hercules, right at the top of the tallest hill in Amman. The temple was never finished, which has led historians to speculate that it was a project started by bored Roman soldiers while they were stationed here during the Marcus Aurelius-led 2nd century invasion of the region. If so, the soldiers may have gotten their measurements badly wrong. The temple would have been 100 feet long and 90 feet wide if it were finished, and so it would have been larger than any in Rome. If the statue of Hercules was also to scale, these fingers would have been attached to the hand of a figure that stood 40 feet tall. Father Carlos Crespi Croci, a Salesian monk who lived in Ecuador from 1923 until his death in 1982, amassed a vast collection of over 50,000 objects many of which were gifts from the indigenous people of Ecuador. Crespi, known for his humanitarian efforts and deep interest in indigenous cultures, received these artifacts as tokens of gratitude. The collection, which was once housed in the courtyard of the church Maria Auxiliadora, included a variety of items, from metallic carved plates to religious icons. Unfortunately, a significant portion of the collection was destroyed in a fire in 1962, 
and the whereabouts of the remaining artifacts became a subject of speculation and mystery. The story of Father Crespi and his collection gained notoriety due to sensational claims made by Swiss author Eric von Däniken in his book Gold of the Gods. Däniken suggested that part of Crespi's collection came from a mysterious metallic library found in the Teos Caves of Ecuador, allegedly containing golden artifacts and evidence of a lost civilization with extraterrestrial connections. While the story of Father Crespi has been dramatized over the years, the true nature and origin of a small number of his artifacts remain a mystery, leaving some questions unanswered. Why were the ancient Romans so fond of making dodecahedrons? If you can answer that question, you'll have outperformed every expert and archaeologist who's ever studied them. You'll find them buried at Roman archaeological sites in every former territory of the Roman Empire, but we have no idea what their significance or purpose might have been. They also often turn up in ancient Roman shipwrecks, which might point to the idea of them being navigational aids of some kind, but we can't work out how they might have helped with such a task. What we do know is that the Romans carried on making them for centuries. The earliest examples of dodecahedrons are made from stone, but later versions are crafted from bronze instead. Some archaeologists have suggested that they might have been ornate candlestick holders, but that seems unlikely based on the fact that none of them has any traces of wax on their surfaces. Another idea is that they might have been part of a Roman game of some kind. Roman soldiers were fond of board games to pass the time, so that's possible, but there's still no evidence to support the idea. There are so many examples of this strange Roman preoccupation that we have to classify them as a mystery hiding in plain sight. There's plenty of ancient history to look at in Ireland, but not many places possess the beauty and wonder of New Grange Barrow and its passage tomb. It's an ancient tomb in the Boyne Valley area of Meath and was built by Neolithic people over 5,000 years ago. Even though it's older than both Stonehenge and the Pyramids of Giza, it's remarkably well preserved, with the intricate swirling patterns in the rock still sharp and clearly defined. New Grange is best described as a passage tomb and one that was built to be in perfect alignment with the stars. The best time of year to see it is the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, because on that day, the rising sun shines through the passage and illuminates the central chamber. This would have likely had a special meaning to the people who used the site, although nobody knows precisely what that meaning might be. Getting close to the site at the solstice isn't easy though. Admission is only permitted with a ticket, and there are usually 30,000 applications each year. The astronomical ceiling of Senenmut's tomb, a significant archaeological site in Egypt, dates back to the 18th dynasty, circa 1479 to 1458 BCE. Located at Deir el-Bari in Thebes, Upper Egypt, this tomb is known for its unique ceiling decorations, which are among the earliest forms of astronomical decorations in tombs. The tomb, belonging to Senenmut, an architect and government official, features a celestial diagram consisting of a northern and a southern panel. These panels depict circumpolar constellations in the form of disks, each divided into 24 sections, suggesting a 24-hour time period, lunar cycles, and sacred deities of Egypt. The only constellation certainly identifiable is Mesketu with the Big Dipper. The diagram also includes representations of Sirius, Orion, Ursa Major, and Draco, along with symbols for different seasons of the year. The significance of the astronomical ceiling in Senenmut's tomb extends beyond its artistic value. It provides insights into ancient Egyptian astronomy, chronology, mythology, and religion, illustrating the Egyptians' desire to understand the heavens and apply that understanding to their gods. The detailed depiction of astronomy and deities on the ceiling symbolizes the Egyptians' attempt to connect the divine with the mortal world. The official story of the Incan ruins of Olantaytambo in Peru is that they are all that remains of a city built by Emperor Pachacuti during the 15th century. The alternative version is that while extensive building work may have been performed at the site during the 15th century, there are several signs that much of the stonework and masonry are far older. Pachacuti's alterations and restorations are impressive in their own way, but the older sections of the site have to be seen to be believed. Huge 50-ton blocks of stone were seemingly dragged up mountains and placed perfectly together so they interlocked. 
with no space between them at all. Even now, after all these years, the surfaces of some of the stones are as smooth as glass. To achieve this effect now, we'd heat up the rock to make it softer, and therefore easier to shape and fit together. But how would that have been possible if the site is 12,000 years old, as some claim? The crisscross marks at the Temple of Condor are particularly hard to explain. They look as if they were left by saws, but the people who built Olente Tambo were allegedly working with nothing more advanced than bronze tools. As difficult as this might be for historians and archaeologists to accept, the Egyptian pyramids don't appear to be the oldest in the world. It's more likely that the world's oldest is the Hellenican period, also known as the Pyramid of Eleniko, which is the most significant of all the Greek pyramids of Argolis. Aside from being a pyramid, it bears few similarities to its Egyptian equivalents. Unlike the Egyptian pyramids, it wasn't used as a tomb, and in reality, we have no idea what its purpose might have been. Dating the Pyramid of Eleniko is easier said than done. It's referenced in the writings of the ancient Greek geographer Pausanias, which means it was already standing by the second century. But a thermoluminescence test has suggested that it's considerably older than that, and might have been built 6,000 years ago. In answer to that problem, scientists say that thermoluminescence testing is unreliable and that the limestone block construction technique is more consistent with the Hellenistic era. Perhaps they're right, but the difficulties in dating it using any technique other than thermoluminescence will continue to prompt questions until someone's able to answer them. The Tale of Atlantis is a myth but that myth could be based on any one of dozens of real-life ancient cities and settlements that disappeared beneath the waves in the distant past. One of them is Yonaguni in Japan, home of the Yonaguni Monument. Its very existence is a contentious subject among academics. To our eyes, and perhaps to yours too, these structures look like they must have been assembled by human hands. Many scientists like to tell us that's impossible and that what we're looking at is nothing more than natural rock formations beneath the water. The debate over who's right and who's wrong has been raging ever since Yonaguni was discovered by divers in 1987. If it's a human-made monument, it's a colossal one. It's 100 feet tall and 500 feet wide, with sharp edges and parallel faces. The remains of what appear to be precisely cut steps are also visible along with what might be a pool next to a triangular-shaped aperture. All of these features suggest intelligent design and human involvement, but which humans and when? The Pyramid of Cestius, an ancient Roman pyramid in Rome, Italy, stands as a unique testament to the Roman fascination with Egyptian culture. Built around 12 BCE as a tomb for Gaius Cestius, a member of the Epilonus Religion Corporation, this pyramid is one of the best-preserved ancient buildings in Rome, thanks to its incorporation into the city's fortifications. Measuring about 100 feet square at the base and standing 125 feet high, the pyramid is constructed of brick-faced concrete covered with slabs of white marble, resting on a travertine foundation. Inside the pyramid lies a burial chamber, a simple barrel-vaulted rectangular cavity measuring about 20 feet long, 13 feet wide, and 16 feet high. When opened in 1660, the chamber was found to be adorned with frescoes, although only scant traces of these survive today. The tomb was originally sealed with no exterior entrance, but had been plundered likely during antiquity. Since 2015, the pyramid has been opened to the public on select days, allowing visitors to explore this fascinating piece of ancient Roman architecture. The Pyramid of Cestius, with its blend of Roman and Egyptian styles, stands as a symbol of the cultural intermingling of ancient civilizations and remains a significant historical landmark in Rome. If you found out a historic site had a name like the Pyramid of the Magician and it didn't have a mysterious story behind it, you'd be a little disappointed. Fortunately, this enormous Mayan monument does. The Step Pyramid, which is also known as the Pyramid of the Soothsayer, is one of the most recognizable sites in Uxmal, an ancient city that is itself described as the Jewel of the Puk. This was once the capital city of the Puk region, ruled by the Tutul Chui. The Pyramid of the Soothsayer is the most remarkable thing left standing in the old city, and it's roughly 1,500 years old. At 115 feet tall, it dominates the skyline. 
Even now, the indigenous Mayan people tell folk tales of how it was built, with a magician god named Itzamna usually credited with its creation. It's from him that it gets its name. The legends say that he used his powers to build it in just one single night. Variations of the story say that a dwarf magician who hatched from an egg created the whole thing after being challenged to build a pyramid in 24 hours under the threat of death from an ancient Uxmal king. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!